I often hear people on the right who began their political lives as Democrats say that they didn't leave the Democrat Party as much as the Democrat Party left or abandoned them. To an extent, that's true with me, but not entirely, because some of my movement to the right was me responding to the Democrat Party, and especially, especially to the left elements that I saw in it back in the early 1970s. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. As an undergraduate student, and I started college in 1969, I flirted with what you'd call the extreme left. And I want to look at my interactions with the extreme left on campus, Temple University in Philadelphia. And I just, there's loads of things I could go through, but there's three that I want to focus on in this video, which I think are illustrative of the nature of those groups. Now, these weren't Antifa, these weren't BLM. But when I see Antifa and BLM today, they remind me of these other groups. In fact, the guy who was the head of the group at Temple at the time I'm talking about, during Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Philadelphia, I actually saw him in video on uh, YouTube leading a demonstration, an Occupy demonstration in Philadelphia. Same guy, much older. He's a little bit older than me. He may have retired by now. He may not be involved with Antifa, or perhaps he passed away. But these are the same people. They're just older, and they have their younger replacements working for them. And I know how things operate. When I arrived at Temple in 1969, the Students for Democratic Society, the SDS, were gone. They'd fallen apart. And you went through several years there where the organizations were changing names all the time and coming up with new, new variations of Marxist orientation, Trotskyist, Maoist, whatever. Uh, my freshman year, there was a guy who was the recognized head of these groups on Temple. And he had, you know, wire room glasses, long curly hair, a floppy hat. He wore a long coat, boots. And he was around. He was a professional revolutionary. He'd take one course a semester so he could be enrolled and could be on campus. And, you know, everybody knew who he was. And he disappeared. And then in sophomore year, there'd been a reorganization. I don't know if he'd been promoted or purged or what happened to the guy. But there was a new group. And it, I think this group eventually, the SDS, becomes a revolutionary student brigade. But at Temple in those days, it had different names. And I, can't, and I think the time I was there, I could be wrong, could have been Revolutionary Student Brigade or Student Revolutionary Brigade. But basically, the people called it the Brigade. And it had a new head. And we'll just call the guy Jack. I don't want to get into names. So, so Jack was the head. And I got to know Jack. And I got to know the people at the Brigade. And there are three incidents that I think tell you a lot about how things operated and also why I was uh, uh, repulsed by this and ultimately started moving away back to the right to where I am, you know, long trek to where I am today. The first event took place in a class. It was a course on the French Revolution and Napoleon. And in that class, I sat next to Jack the head of the brigade. And we got to know each other. We used to talk. I mean, I was leaning left then. He was left. He was always trying to get me to join or at least come to the meetings, which I, I, I would go to their, you know, they had a state-supported uh, office suite over in the Student Activity Center, paid for by, you know, Pennsylvania taxpayers. And you could go there and hang out, which I, I did on occasion when I had time after breakfast or during lunch or something like that, I had a relatively busy schedule. And, and Jack and I were in this class, and we were having a discussion one day with a professor, French Revolution, about Jacobins. And we got to the topic of Gracchus Babouf. Now, probably most of you don't have a clue who Gracchus Babouf was, but Babouf was a, 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 a radical, even among the radical Jacobins. He was very radical. And he uh, is credited as being a, a proto-Marxist. In other words, some of the ideas that Babouf laid out in his thinking later on would be picked up by Marx. So basically, he was espousing a form of Marxism before Marx. Uh, and he ultimately, after the Jacobins fall, and there, there's the reaction comes in, he ends up in 1797 being guillotined himself. 
but he wrote this long defense of his actions, and it's published. You can find it in paperback, uh, Defense of Gracchus by Buff. And that's what we were, we had to read in the class, and that's what we were discussing. But Buff said many things. One of the things he said was he wanted to use the power of the revolution, the power of the state, to create a new kind of man, a man who didn't want to be, who didn't seek riches, men who didn't seek you know, wealth, men who didn't seek to be wiser than other men, and men who didn't seek power over other men. And you know, if you think about that, these three of those things, forget the wealth part, you know, he basically, to make sure people didn't want to seek power over others, he was seeking power over others to prevent them from seeking power over others. I mean, there's, there's obviously a, a contradiction there. And the other thing that's really strange about that is he didn't think it was right for people to want to be wiser than other people. I mean, it's, it's kind of anti-intellectual. I mean, he believed he knew better than everybody else because he considered himself an intellectual. But what he wanted to do was have a society where people wouldn't seek to be wiser than others. I mean, how can you not seek to be wiser than other people? Some people are just smarter than other people. But let's face it, there are people who are smarter than me, there are people who are less smart than me. That's just the, the reality of life. So the professor was making this argument that a lot of his ideas, you know, just wouldn't fly. And even people with any kind of common sense would reject them. And Jack, the head of the brigade, took, you know, he, he just didn't buy that. And he started saying, no, no, that's not true. You know, that's not true. They just needed to be better educated. And I remember the professor, it was something like this. He said, you know, they need to be better educated. And the professor said, well, you know, what if you educate them and they still don't buy it because it's, it's going to be a hard sell? He said, well, then you need to put them in more intensive education. He said, like, what are you talking about? Forcing them into the, go into certain classes or schools? Are you going to incarcerate them for a while? And he said, well, yeah, maybe. And then the professor said, well, well, what if they get out of there and they say what you want them to say, and then when they leave, they still don't buy it? He said, well, then you need even, you know, more stringent controlled places to put them in to make sure that they, they get the message. And he said, well, what if you use, what are you talking like, Dachau? And the guy said, well, yeah, you know, work camps or, you know, re-education. Of course, you had all this stuff, you know, with Mao and the, the Cultural Revolution going on. And the professor said, well, you know, do you, you know, is that really, what, what if you do all that? And they said, they still, they work for six months or a year. And then they say, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. And they leave and they still don't buy it. And at this point, Jack got frustrated. He said, well, then you line the MFers up against the wall and you start shooting them until they get the message. And I remember thinking to myself, and the professor was like, you know, and some of the kids were looking like this. And, and here's the head of a student revolutionary brigade on campus. Everybody knew who he was. And he's basically talking about lining people who don't buy their argument up against the wall and shooting them. Now, when I see Antifa on TV today, BLM, these are the same people. And I know that if you get them into a debate and they, they lose it, like Jack did that day with the, with the professor, that's what they're willing to do to get their way. Line people up against the wall and you start shooting them. And, you know, he said that in class. And I can remember thinking, whoa, whoa, you know, maybe I don't want to join this group. And I never did. The second incident occurred in May 1972. Richard Nixon was president, and in order to cut off the resupply of missiles and other military supplies coming into North Vietnam, much of which came in through the uh, port of Hanoi, Haiphong, Haiphong Harbor, the U.S. used aerial mining to mine the harbor to prevent the ships from getting in. And that had just occurred. It was toward the end of the semester. I was over at the Student Activity Center, and I went up to the, the brigade room, and I went in there, and they were all in an uproar. And I, th I think, let me first say something about the people that I used to see in that room. You know, you had your hardcore revolutionary cadre. That's what they called themselves, the cadre. You know, John was the head, and Jack. And he, 
you know, I used to ask him, well, where do you get your money from? You know, your parents? I and mean, he was always fuzzy about, you know, where he was getting his support. But he he would be there. And, you know, he'd, and then you had a couple other people who were like his lieutenants. But the bulk of the people in that room you would find in there were these weirdos. Uh, the guys were, for the most part, nerds. Uh, talking to some of them, you know, I sat down and I, and I talked. You know, I was, I had, taking courses in, in the Russian Revolution, and I was reading, you know, works of Marx and uh, Lenin's collected works, and I was reading all this stuff, and I'd go in there sometimes to see if I could get into discussions about, you know, variations of Marxist doctrine and things, and basically they were talking about, hey, you see that new girl, you know, oh, she's really hot, and I came to the conclusion a lot of these guys were in there hoping to pick up chicks and get laid. That, that, that was basically it. And one of the things they used to love to do, and I'd see it a lot, and you, you see it today, you watch TV and you see these, these people on the left, they go screaming and they throw these tantrums and they, they would do that. So, you know, Nixon would do something or say something or something would happen in the world. And I'd go in there and it'd be this guy, he'd be, he'd be purple with rage and he'd be screaming at the top of his lungs, F Nixon, F Nixon, I hate Nixon, I want to kill Nixon. You know, he'd get to the point where he'd be, he'd be crying and then he'd crumble down into a ball on the floor and inevitably, inevitably, some cute girl would come over and she'd put her arm around him and say, you know, it's okay, Brian, you know, just stop crying, get a hold of yourself here, you know, and he'd be like, and he'd lean on her, and i think, oh my God, you know, this guy's trying to pick up chicks this way, but it, it was really disgusting. The girls were mostly airheads, they didn't know, and they would be chanting, and, you know, they didn't know what the hell was going on half the time. And, you know, I said something to John once, or Jack. I said, you know, what, 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 what's going on with these people? He said, oh, you know, they're never going to join, but, you know, we, we can indoctrinate them and then they'll go out and they'll get, get jobs as teachers or, you know, this or that or whatever they're doing. And they'll, you know, those idea, they'll infect their kids. And, you know, that's the whole idea of spreading the ideas. But I went into it one day and they're freaking the F out because Nixon had mined Haiphong Harbor. So I walk in. Now, you know, I'm interested in all this stuff. I'm also a budding military historian, so I understand a lot of that. And I became a naval historian, so I know a lot about navies. Even then, I knew a lot. And they're saying, the, the couple of them are saying, you know, I hope the, the, the Soviets send their, their Pacific fleet down there, you know, and, and they, they sink all our ships and, and everybody's killed. And, and they said, what do you think? What do you think, Mike? And, and I said, well, you know... Uh, you know, the Soviet Navy up in Vladivostok, you know, they're, they're not very big. They don't have any aircraft carriers. To get out, they got to go between South Korea and Japan, both U.S. allies. Then they have to go down and they have to sail between uh, the Philippines and Taiwan, both U.S. allies. And then they get all the way down into the South China Sea, where we had, I don't know how many carriers we had covering the mining operation. The carriers were dropping the mines with their, some of their planes. Uh, they don't have any basis down there. They have the Soviet Navy has no undersea replenishment capability. They're going to be far out from a home basis. They just get slaughtered. They don't get sunk if they ever got there. I said, it's not going to happen. They're not going to try it. I said, you know, you're wasting your time. You think they're going to come down and they're going to take out our ships. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, you know, and he's whining and all, and they're crying, and it's terrible, Nixon, Nixon, you know, and mining, oh, he's a war criminal, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then I said, you know, you know, it, you know, I have a lot of friends on those ships, and I did. I had a lot of my friends who were draft age, didn't want to end up, you know, humping around in the, the jungles of Vietnam or up in the highlands, uh, so they would volunteer. If your number came up in the the, uh, the draft lottery and it was pretty low and you were likely to get called up, I remember one day, like one guy's number came up, he immediately went to uh, volunteer for the Navy. So a lot of the people I knew were on aircraft carriers because that's where, you know, you join the Navy carrier crews were huge with the air wing and the, the ship complement. And it was a good chance you'd end up on a carrier off Vietnam. And a lot of them were. I knew like three or four guys who were on these carriers. And I said, you know, if the Soviets did come down and didn't manage to sink our ships, there are people on those ships, and they're just like us. They're our age. Some of them are my friends. I said, you know, doesn't that bother you? You're talking about killing all these Oh, they're war criminals. They're baby killers. They should all be killed. And I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> these guys are sitting here at the university with the student deferments, and these, these poor guys who 
for one reason or another didn't go to college are stuck, not by choice. They're not, they don't want to go over and kill babies. They've been forced by the draft to either be drafted and dumped into Vietnam or forced by the threat of a draft to volunteer, join the Navy, and they're over there on these ships. And all they want to do is, you know, smoke dope and come home. Uh, you know, they're not looking to kill babies or destroy Vietnam. And, 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 he, and these people want them killed. And I really found it, you know, offensive that these privileged people, and I knew a lot of them. I mean, I was working, you know, at a factory at night. And these guys didn't even have jobs. And they're playing around with Marxism and, and revolution. You know, it's chic, you know, and and it, it, it was kind of disgusting, to tell you the truth. And it, it really repelled me. And it was, again, another reason that, you know, I never actually joined this group. OK, jump ahead two years. It's September 1974. Uh, I'm in my second year of the MA program at Temple. I've got my undergraduate degree. Jack is still the head of a student revolutionary brigade. And I'm over in the student activity center one morning. I think it was a Tuesday, I'm pretty sure. And I go in just to see what's happening there. And I walk in, and they're all on the floor, and they're all working at tables and on the floor and on the chairs. And they're making posters, and they're making banners, and they're making signs and placards and all these things. And it's all support Ethiopia. Support Ethiopia. I'm thinking, like, what's this all about? Now, for some context, if you don't remember, and probably most of you don't, at that time, Ethiopia, which was ruled by the Emperor Haile Selassie, you know, who'd been our ally since World War II, was at a war in war with a certain area between Somalia and Ethiopia along the border, where they're fighting today, still, uh, 50 years later, basically. And the United States was supporting Ethiopia, and the Soviet Union was supporting Somalia. They were our, you know, proxies, and they were going to war in the Tigray region down there between Ethiopia and Somalia. So here are all these lefties making these placards to support Ethiopia. And this doesn't make any sense to me. I said, why are you making these signs? I said, well, Jack came in with some other guys and they told us to make the signs. And then uh, yesterday and then this morning, all the, the stuff came, the, the wood, the paper, the markers, the, the, the slogan sheet, you know, here, here, here are the things you're, you're to write, you know, you know, these little chants and things like that. And they're getting it already. And I'm thinking, like, did they tell you why we're doing this? Why you're doing this? And they said, no. He just said to do it. You know, don't worry about it. Just do it. And I'm looking around. Is, is he here? I said, no. They said, no. So I, I, I couldn't find him. I couldn't find out what was going on. And I think that was a Tuesday. The next day, uh, I, don't, I don't think I had class. I had other things I had to do, and I, and I did them. Wednesday night, or maybe it was Thursday night. I can't remember. But... I turn on the news. It's like a day later or two days later. And I turn on the news. Yeah, it was Wednesday night. This was Tuesday. It was a Wednesday. So to turn on the news Wednesday night, you know, 6.30, national news, Walter Cronkite or, you know, John Chancellor. I don't know what I was watching. And there'd been a coup in Ethiopia. Haile Selassie had been overthrown by this Marxist clique in the military. I think they're a junta. It was called the Derg or something. And uh, it was one of his, Colonel Mengitsu, and there were some other guys involved. And the, basically, they did a Marxist coup in Ethiopia, and Haile Selassie and his government had been overthrown. And suddenly, it hit me. This happened Wednesday. Tuesday morning, in the brigade room over to Student Activity Center, they were making posters and placards to support Ethiopia the day before the coup. The day before the coup, they were over there making the signs they would need for Thursday morning to go out and protest and call for support for Ethiopia, which was a flip-flop because the Soviets now backed Ethiopia. We ended up backing Somalia. Uh, so somebody knew there was going to be a coup in Ethiopia who would know that? Who was running this coup? The Soviet Union. 
but the common term doesn't exist. But somehow, somebody in the United States in this revolutionary brigade setup knew there was a coup, and they directed people all the way down to Temple University to Jack to get his brigade preparing the signs for Thursday morning on Tuesday. And that's what had happened. And I immediately knew that the brigade at Temple was being controlled by people who were connected to the Soviet Union, what in the old days we would call the common term, the Communist International. There's no way they, I mean, how else would they know that there was going to be a coup? They weren't going to guess. Jack didn't guess. I, I think there might be a coup, you know, in 48 hours, within 48 hours in Ethiopia. So, you know, we better, we better get these signs ready. No, 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 no. This was all controlled. The materials were delivered Tuesday morning. The sheet and all the things to put on them, you know, different chants and different lines and different slogans. Everything was supplied by Tuesday. So somebody as early as Monday, at the minimum, knew what was going to go down on Wednesday. I think it was a Wednesday. My days could be off by one here. In Ethiopia. And they were prepared for it. So when I went to campus on Thursday morning, there were the placards across campus, you know, things on the sign, support Ethiopia. And people were marching around and all this stuff was going on. And I thought, holy, you know. And that was the last time I ever stepped foot in that place. Because that's when I realized these people aren't just hard left people who want social change in the United States. They're working for a foreign government. In this case, it was the Soviet Union. Now, I'm not saying they're working for a foreign government today. I ver doubt very much it's the Soviet Union. But who, there is no Soviet Union, but I'm not, I mean, Russia, I'm not saying it's China, I'm not saying it's anything. All I'm saying is at that time, that event told me what was going on, that that group wasn't just some independent left-wing group floating around Temple University campus. It was part of a coordinated effort run from Moscow. And, and I never went in there again. I no longer talked to any of those people. I didn't want to have anything to do with them because I didn't want to get, you know, connected in any way to that organization because these people were, as far as I was concerned, traitors. And I looked back at, you know, my experience with them, and there were others that I'm not going into here, but, you know, controlled by Moscow, hoping that the Soviet Navy wipes out the U.S. Navy and kills all our people you know, th saying hateful things about the United States, hateful people, uh, hateful things about the American people. And then the incident with uh, Jack in, you know, talking about Gracchus by Buff, and when he gets pressed, you know, put everybody up against the wall and shoot them. And I thought, no, no, this isn't for me. And that, that was, it's not the only thing that started moving me back to the right, but it's one of the things, one of the big things that pushed me back to the right. It has nothing to do with the Democrat Party per se. But of course, today, the Democrat Party is clearly in bed with such groups, Antifa, BLM, that they weren't with at the time. So that's changed. But that makes me even more repulsed by, you know, when I see BLM, Antifa do things in our cities over the summer, into the fall, and you see the Democrat Party unwilling to condemn them. T to me, it's just disgusting. And it's, if anything, it's, not, it's driving me further to the right. Those are my memories. Uh, let me know if you have any from your college days. And uh, let me know in a comment. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you can, share it with your friends. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. And until the next time, keep fighting.